Thank you. Uh, I'm originally from a small town in Minnesota, and my parents fortunately raised me with the idea that you can do whatever you want, you should love what you do, it's important that you take that as part of your heart and move forward in life that way. And little did they know, though, that, that was really, I was going to grab hold of that and have that be at the source of how I live my life. So when um, their son told them they wanted, he, he wants to go to art school uh, outside of the state, not even just outside of Minneapolis, but all the way out to the West Coast, they were surprised to say the least. And fortunately, they let me take that journey and come out to San Francisco and study art. And when I graduated from art school out here, I actually went into the toy industry and designing toys and design, drawing them and sculpting them. And I quickly realized that this wasn't the path for me. And I was speaking to a mentor of mine, a masterful sculptor in his own right, about what was going on in my life. And he said, well, there's someone you, know, you may want to consider talking to. And he's actually a lead animator in the Industrial Light Magic. He might give you some great guidance. So, you know, two weeks later, I'm driving over Industrial Light Magic, where they made Star Wars, and I was getting a tour of all these beautiful sculptures and drawings in the building. And we sat down, and we're in his office. He's got these big computer screens up, looking at my work, shuffling through my portfolio. And he asked me, he said, if I gave you a magic wand and you could do anything, what would you do? And I said, well, if I could do anything and money wasn't an option, well, then I would take on a fine art sculpting career. He's like, exactly, because that's exactly what your portfolio represents. To be frank, your fine art is far better than your commercial art. And why would you want to get so, work so hard to get into this industry just so that you can leave it and get into something else that you really want to do in the first place? You know, the quickest way from San Francisco to LA is take the 101 or the highway straight there. Not to take an exit off and then get back on the on-ramp and then take another exit and then get back on the on-ramp, but stickly, simply stay on the highway all the way there. And LA is your fine art career. And I was like, wow, you're really um, touching a good point there. He's like, well, this is something I want to do. And he said, well, do you at least have a job that you can support yourself so you can feed and put a roof over your head. And I was like, yes, I do have that covered. And in that moment, I made a decision that I'm totally changing my whole career. <laughs> and that drive home that night was possibly the best drive I've ever had in my life because it was like the world had been lifted up off my shoulders and I can really follow my dreams. Now, I took a big leap a couple months later and got an art studio in the Excelsior District in San Francisco and it was about 400 square feet. I got ceilings that are about 20 feet tall, and there's nothing in there. And I'm looking around. I said, well, what should I do? How should I get started? And I said, well, if I'm going to do this, I'm really going to do this like, as a source. Like, to make my art's going to be a way in which I can express myself to the world, the emotions that are going through me, the things that I've experienced, and a way to talk to the rest of the world through my sculptures. So the next question is, well, what's going on in my life? What would I like to share? And so I kept thinking. I was like, well, what's there for me is the fact that um, I'm a Christian. And maybe I can make something inspired by that. And I was like, that's really what's going on with me. But in that moment, I had a variety of concerns like, well, this is the West Coast. This is the Bay Area. People aren't open to this. They have a variety of opinions. Everyone's really independent. But on the other hand, I was like, but this is who I really am, and this is what's important to me, and this is what matters. I'm like, but then which other gallery is ever going to accept anything like that? And I was like, but this is who I am, and this is the reason why I took this on. So why contradict that in the start of getting this whole thing going? And this is um, actually a sculpture that I made when I came out of college, and this is what I was originally working with. So. To go from this to something else was pretty extreme for me to start expressing myself versus something that's really Ill illustrative of someone else's viewpoint. And uh, so I took this on and decided to honor that which is really important to me versus the concerns I have about other people. And since I only had so much money, I can only afford so much, which meant my sculptures had to be around 10 inches tall. And, <laughs> and I'm like, well, all right, but this is the thing. If anything's really possible, you can still have it be powerful. 
you know, you don't have to make something huge to be powerful, but something can be just as powerful even though it's only 10 inches tall. And with that said, the other curveball I threw myself was you got to sculpt it in one hour. And why make the sculpture in one hour? Because I knew that that would be a great support system or structure that would have me sculpt it freely and have the piece be alive and vibrant. And this is uh, the three sculptures that I made. And going from left to right, left is called passion, taking your passion. The center one's called willingness, being willing to express yourself and take your passion. And the one on the right is called embrace, being willing to embrace that which whatever comes your way when you're taking on your passion. And the title of these three are called Living Without Resistance. So often we fight things that we want to get in life and what would it be like to actually not fight that. Uh, and I was so concerned about this. I was like, well, to move forward, I have to at least start talking to different galleries about it. So I drove down to Carmel, didn't have a single appointment, and like had my little book, walked in, and I said, where's the art director? I would love to show my book to somebody. The lady's like, that's me. And she grabbed my book, flipped open, flipped through the pages and said, I'll take that one, that one, and that one. I was like, whoa, that was pretty easy. <laughs> and then a month and a half later, she calls me up and says, what's your address? I was like, why do you want my address? She's like, because I got to mail you a check. Someone just bought them. I was like, whoa. Other people than just my friends actually like this and are willing to put money down for this? <laughs> Maybe I got something here. Now, I continued to make other sculptures and exhibit at different places, and I wanted to know, like, what was the next way to challenge myself and take it to the next level? And I'm in Las Vegas now and just visiting Las Vegas, and of course, like everyone, you go to a Cirque du Soleil show, and I'm looking down at the crowd of people who are performing and how they move through space and they're jumping over each other and they're acrobatic and it's contemporary and it's nothing I've never seen before. I was like, wow, this is amazing. This is going to be the next direction in which I take my art. I fly back to San Francisco and I look up different contemporary dance companies in San Francisco that I could work with. But I have a variety of concerns once again, like I'm just a little, little punk who's in his 20s who's trying to do something. Who's going to really listen to me? But, you know, I'm actually genuinely excited about this. And so I move forward, and then I end up following, finding one dance company called Post Ballet. I meet with the director, Robert Deckers. He loves my work. I love his. And we have about a month before his big dance performance in San Francisco. He uh, brings one of his models, or one of his dancers over, his professional dancers, Ashley, and we run through a different a variety of poses that I could sculpt, because I told him, you know, I want to sculpt something inspired by your dance performance. And she gets on the stage, and she's posing this, and we're talking, like, that's not it, nope, next, that's not it, nope, next, that's not it either. And I turn to him, I ask him, like, so what's the intention behind the dance performance? What has you create this? And remember earlier we were talking about intentions and setting that forth and having that make a difference with you. Uh, and he said, well, the intention behind this is, you know, when you have an idea or inspiration, are you going to start bringing that into reality and doing something with that, or are you going to let that just fizzle away? So this is one of the poses that we came up with. And this is of Ashley, and she's called In Light. And she's holding a candle over her head, and her body's starting to get illuminated because light is like the inspiration, it's the candle, and you know where to go when you have a candle or a flashlight in front of you. Versus the next piece called In Darkness, and he doesn't have the inspiration, he's in dark, and he doesn't have the direction to move in. And after I gave these elaborate speeches about the, working with a dance company, and the number one question I get is, did they really pose that way? <laughs> it's like, yes, his leg was up that high, and he was holding it, but he did have a little pedestal to rest it on. And one thing that I found working with these professional contemporary dancers is how powerful they are. And the ability to move through these poses so gracefully, that which are like so challenging to the body. And that was part of my intent, was to capture the grace in which they move through space as if, you know, and my sculpture captures that moment in time. And interestingly enough, uh, Robert Decker, the director, says, so interesting because in dance, you never have the same dance performance again. There's no way to repeat the same thing again. You'll get something similar, but not the same thing. But within sculpture, they're modeling for me live in front of me, and I'm bringing all these moments together to cap and bring it encapsulated into one moment. And 
this collection was such a great success, we worked again the following year, and within two years we made about 21 sculptures of his different dancers. Now, after that was quite the journey, and I realized, you know, I've been working with other people and collaborating with them and being inspired by what they have to say. It was extraordinary. But the thing that was missing for me was being able to like, share myself once again intimately with the rest of the world. So um, living life in San Francisco, I'm like, what's going on? What's, what's important to me? What are the things I'm experiencing? And what you know, is right there for me is the fact that I'm in this great loving relationship with this awesome woman. And it's completely new for me. And it's been a while since something like that has happened. And I'm like, great, this is what the next sculpture is going to be about. It's about me falling in love. And then I had those concerns again, like, well, that sounds really cheesy. But I was like, but it's really, I'm really falling in love and I'm having a great time with her. But like, who, that's going to sound like stupid. Who's going to be able to appreciate that? I was like, but I think about her all the time and our relationship's extraordinary. So this is, which one am I going to choose to honor? And I go with like, what's really going on in my life? And regardless of how concerned I am about what, again, I said, other people think. And I actually titled the sculpture Fallen in Love. It was the first time I ever titled a piece before I finished it. Now, I call a model up. She comes over to my studio, and I tell her, this is the intention behind my piece. This is what's going on with me. I have this great relationship. I'm in love. And I want to get you on the same page so that you, we can create this thing together. What's going on in your life? Are you in love? Have you ever been in a relationship like that? And she said what she said. And I asked her, like, what, we started talking about what do you think it means to be in love? And what is it like to fall in love? And, what, you know, I told her, it's like, this is such a refreshing change of pace. And I'm really excited about making this because I've been on, like, a million Tinder dates. And to have something like this stick is so great. I'm done with swiping. <laughs> and uh, she got on stage. And, she, and I was like, the thing is, is like, I want you to be able to pose in such a way that expresses you've fallen in love, because we got on the same page with it. So she went on stage, she's posing in different ways, and I'm like, that's great, that's awesome, well, how about you try this? And she tries something else, I'm like, that's awesome, how about you try this? And the key thing is, is like, while I'm, while I'm guiding her, it's important for me, such that she has the experience of falling in love, and allowing to express that, not me to shut it down, and force her into the pose that I want her, that I think best represents it. Because then that would just translate into my art, and I don't want anything forced or contrived in my art. And this is the sculpture that I made called Falling in Love. Five different poses, all on one. And, uh, you know, I was so concerned, even after I made it, I was like, gee, is this even good or not? I don't know. Um, I guess I'll take a picture and post it on Facebook, you know, and we'll see what happens. And... I thought I'd get like five likes, uh, but apparently in two days I got more likes on that post than anything else I've ever done. And within uh, two days, people started asking me how much does it cost, and I got someone bought it on day three, and then another gallery in San Francisco wanted to take it and put it on display. I was like, well, no, sorry, somebody already bought it. And they're like, can you make something else like it? Well, we can talk about that. And then, uh, you know, what's so interesting is, you know, like, I made this about me and what's going on in my life when I'm sharing this with different people. Um, they often get, I'm found out, they get moved by it. Like, um, there's this couple that I had dinner with just the other night, and I showed her the same picture. And even though she's in her mid-50s, and I'm now currently 33, and I told her the whole story I'm just telling you. She's like, oh, I can relate to it so much because my husband... Tra stop traveling so much I get to spend time with him. It's like as if I get to fall in love with him all over again. And I'm just impressed and amazed and awed at how even though someone from a different culture or different age can still relate to the same thing because they've actually, we've all experienced the same mo emotions in life. And, you know, what I, you know, I recommend you take it on the same thing, but not, as, not like you have to change your career and start making huge sculptures and doing stuff like that. But at the very least, start to you know, sit down with a friend, have a glass of wine, and share with them about what's going on with your life and what's personal, but specifically the things that you haven't been willing to share with people. And you'll be you know, pleasantly surprised how much they appreciate that and the difference it makes 
and the relationships that you can start developing with those people when you start getting authentic and real with them. Thank you very much.